Romans chapter 3, begin reading verse 21, read down to verse 31. Again, this series has been going through here on Sunday mornings through the book of Romans, and I trust uh, it's been a blessing. Let's stand together if you're able to stand. If not, remain seated. But follow along as I read. <clears throat> verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. I pray today, this morning, as I'm preaching the message that I believe you've led me to preach, that you pre please give me a fresh filling of thy spirit. Lord, enable me to preach your word. I pray that all of us listening today would recognize that what we're looking at here is not the words of men, but as it is in truth, the very words of God. And I pray, Lord, we treat it appropriately by responding to it, giving reverence to it, if you will. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that this morning would be the morning that they'd get saved, the day of salvation for them. And for the believer, Lord, you'd help us revisit, perhaps Calvary today, to once again remember the great work that was done for us at that time. Please bless and enable me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. In 1927, the USS S-4 Navy submarine was surfacing. It was going through a submersion type mission, if you will, or a part where they were down for a while. It was now time for them to come up. This was in Cape Cod off the coast of Massachusetts. As they were coming up, there was another ship coming along the way. Evidently, they had no idea that they were there. Communication somehow broke down. It was a Coast Guard destroyer. And that Coast Guard destroyer rammed that submarine in the side, piercing its side, sinking it down to the bottom. Of course, rescue and salvage operations immediately were radioed, trying to get people out there. But uh, there was a problem, there was severe weather that caused much delay and it couldn't get there as they wanted to. By the time they reached the submarine, got over it, sent divers down, there were only six people still living out of the 40 crew members that were there. And these six were trapped in the forward portion of the submarine, in the torpedo room. They were, evidently they closed the rest of the submarine off and they're huddled right there in the front of the submarine, sharing the little oxygen that was left. As the rescue divers approached the submarine, they were going around the submarine, they approached that place where the men were trapped, they began to hear a noise coming from within. That noise was tapping on the side. And it seemed to be tapping some sort of code and they realized, wait a minute here, this is Morse code. And so they listened. And they listened over and over as those trapped in the submarine Morse coded out a very simple four-word question. The question was this, is there 
any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Is there any hope? You know, that's exactly the question that we find ourselves asking at the opening chapters of the book of Romans for mankind. Is there any hope for mankind? Is there any hope to save our souls? You know, for nearly three chapters, the Apostle Paul has been dealing with the subject of the gospel. We understand that the gospel is defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But understand, the Apostle Paul did not begin there. And the gospel really does not begin there at all. If you look back with me at chapter 1 and verse 18, because we're going to see where the gospel begins. <coughs> we read in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Notice who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's where the gospel begins. It begins with the conviction of sin. You know, we're dealing with people about their soul and the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand, it is absolutely essential that we begin with sin. We begin with the conviction of sin. And what he's saying here is this, that all of mankind is deserving of the wrath of God. That's a pretty bold statement. He makes it here in verse 18, and for the rest of chapter 1, and the rest of chapter 2, and part of chapter 3, he begins to explain that. And he tells us that, that uh, for the next two chapters, uh, he proves that not only those that are engaged in what we would consider obvious sinful behavior, things like the thieves of this world, or the murderers of this world, or the child abusers of this world, those that are defiant of law and order, all of us would nod our head and say, yes, they are no doubt under the wrath of God. God's not happy with them. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to what we would call the moral person there in chapter 2. He describes here that person that we would look at as the good neighbor, the guy that's a nice guy, the one we like. He's that upright citizen, the one who works hard and pays his bills and sends his kids to college and volunteers in community organizations and helps people and everyone looks at him and says, boy, that's a nice guy. Paul declares for all of us to understand that even that moral person is under the wrath of God as well because of his sin. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about the religious man. That man that holds his Bible under his arm. That man that talks about God, that doesn't deny God, but yes, believes in God. He says, I believe in God. He's religious and uh, he has his religion. He may even attend church. He may even perform some sort of religious ceremony, if you will. Maybe he was christened. Maybe he went into the confession booth or he partook of the mass and he's giving his best effort in his own mind uh, uh, to please God and to make himself acceptable to God. And Paul declares to us that this man as well is under the wrath of God because of his sin. And he concludes for us in chapter 3, Notice in verse 19 and 20, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Notice that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Notice he says in verse 19 that, that every mouth is going to be stopped and all of us, all the world uh, will be guilty before God. You say, preacher, so you mean to tell me that the Bible teaches us that no man ever has been or ever will be able to justify himself in the presence of God? Is that what you're saying to me, preacher? That there's no man that can do anything that will satisfy God and the demands of his holy law? You're getting it. You're understanding. 
That's right. We're all guilty. You say it sounds like we're all in an utterly hopeless situation. Well, up to this point in the book of Romans, we are. Until verse 21. Notice what we read. The two words, but now. <laughs> this whole thing's going to change direction. This whole thing's going to turn right here. And, and, and suddenly after nearly three chapters of, if you will, being beaten down with our self-righteousness, being told that the moral man and the religious man, and all of us for that matter, are condemned. Suddenly, as we get to chapter 3 and verse 21, God throws us a lifeline. He gives us hope. He shows us there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, there's a rope uh, that he's going to bring down to the bottom of the ditch. And it's a verse that boldly proclaims that, yes, there is hope for mankind. There is an answer. There is a way out. I'd like to preach this morning on the subject. Mankind's only hope for heaven. Do you know that because of sin, mankind without Jesus Christ is hopeless? Absolutely hopeless. Can't we see what this world has become without Jesus Christ? Can't we just read the headlines of just even one day and look at it and read it and shake our head and say, we are an absolute mess? May I remind us this morning that there is hope, not only in this world, but for eternity. And that hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to take a moment as Paul shines this light in this dark place in this chapter and see how he describes for me and for you mankind's only hope for heaven through Jesus Christ. Notice, first of all, number one, the way disclosed. There's a way. You say, what is that way? Look at verse 21 through 23. But now, in the, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you know what's required to get to heaven? The righteousness of God. Would someone here this morning like to raise your hand and stand up? I'll even give you the microphone for a few moments. And tell us how you are as righteous as God in your own self. Tell us while we all snicker and laugh at you trying to do so. Because that's what's required. And all of us fall short. But how do we get this righteousness of God? You see, God has provided a way for you and for me to obtain the righteousness of God. Not to attain, but to obtain it. There's a way. There's a way that you and I can have all of our sins forgiven. That we can be declared by God to be righteous, to be cleansed, to be worthy of heaven. But understand that this righteousness becomes ours not as a result of our own actions or of our conformity to any kind of law or ceremony or rules and regulations. We obtain the righteousness of God solely and entirely through faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It's the only way. It's the only way. That's what he says. Look at verse 21 again. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. But notice he goes on to say, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You know what he's saying here? This isn't something new. This isn't some New Testament thing that no one ever knew about. This is the same way that was told way back in the Old Testament. It was prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. It was pictured in the Old Testament stories. Salvation has always been the same since Genesis chapter 3. 
Right after man sinned uh, and sin entered into this world in Genesis chapter 3, if you remember what Adam and Eve did, they attempted to, by their own efforts to clothe themselves with fig leaves. I believe that's the first place we find religion in the Bible. Trying to cloak themselves, if you would, attempting to get God's satisfaction in their own selves. And what did God do? Well, we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. May I ask you, where did he get those coats of skins? There's only one place. An animal had to be slain. God slayed an innocent animal. Shed the blood of an innocent animal, if you will. And he took the skins of those animals and he clothed Adam and Eve with the, the, with the righteousness there, if you will. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's teaching to all of mankind, not only to Adam and Eve, but to me and you as well, a principle. And the principle is this, substitutionary atonement. In other words, the innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust. And all throughout the Old Testament, every time the Old Testament priest would bring an offering there into the tabernacle, into the temple, day after day that this occurred, week after week, year after year, feast after feast, it reminded the Jews of the Messiah that would come and die for their very sins. Those animals were all a picture of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews tells us it's not through the blood of bulls and goats that a person gets God's righteousness. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through Him. That is the way. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6. No doubt a familiar verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Watch this. And the Lord hath laid on him, that's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. See, I couldn't pay for your sins and you couldn't pay for my sins. Why? Because we're sinners ourselves. We're guilty. It had to be someone without sin. Who's without sin? Only God is without sin. So God left the glories of heaven and came to this earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to go to the cross of Calvary to shed his blood for our sin according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 on Calvary the blood of God was shed for us. Why? The innocent for the guilty. The just for the unjust. It is the way that God has provided. But notice in Romans chapter 3, there's two things I think we notice about obtaining this righteousness of God. Notice, first of all, number one, it's narrowness. Notice we read in verse 21 and 22, but now the righteousness of God without the law, notice, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, watch this, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to obtain this righteousness. And that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May I remind us today that there is no other way. The Bible clearly teaches that there is only one way to heaven. Only one for all of mankind. And that is through Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 10 and verse 43, to him, speaking of Jesus Christ, give all the prophets witness through, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God, watch this, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one mediator. There's only one go-between, Jesus Christ. Jesus said himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, not a way or one of the ways. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No other person can do it. No religion can do it. No religious act can forgive our sins. No other belief system, no matter how moral it may be, no matter how well-intentioned its followers are, there is no other way to heaven than through Jesus Christ. That's it. You say, preacher, you're one of those, huh? Yeah, I'm one of those. 
You know why? Because the Bible's one of those. You see, you say, preacher, you're one of those narrow ones. Oh, huh? that sounds uh, pretty narrow. It is narrow. Jesus Christ himself said it was narrow. Matthew 7, 14, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it again. It is absolutely narrow. Only one way. It's narrowness. But then I notice, secondly, not only it's narrowness, I notice it's convenience. It's so easy. It's for everyone. Look at verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Notice the phrase, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Salvation is available to everyone. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter your skills. It doesn't matter your intelligence level. It doesn't matter your religious or your ethnic or your social background. It doesn't matter the amount of sins you've committed or the type of sins you've committed. It's available for you. And by the way, you don't have to be chosen of God. It's a whosoever will salvation. The question is, will you? Will you? You see, it's narrowness and it's convenience, but there's a third thing I notice, and that is this. It's requirement. There is a requirement. What is it? And upon all them, notice, that believe. <laughs> is that simple? Yes. Simply believe. That simple. John 3.36 sums it up. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's that simple. Jesus said in John 5, 24, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Again, Paul is reminding all of us here that yes, it's dark in the first three chapters there. Yes, we're all condemned and we wonder, is there any hope? He says boldly, he proclaims, yes, uh, there is a hope. It's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder if there's someone here today that's never accepted him as Savior. I hope you do it today. Because life is short, eternity is long, and heaven and hell are as real as Dover, Delaware. And you're going to be in one of those two places. You can be in heaven if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. So we see the way disclosed. It's a simple way. But then he doesn't stop there. We see, secondly, notice the work described. Notice what he says in verse 24. He says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He's going now on to explain exactly what the work of Calvary did. You know, sometimes we forget that. You get saved for a while and you, you forget exactly what happened on the cross of Calvary. So much happened there. So many wonderful things. And he begins to take just a little piece and describes uh, what exactly it was that Jesus Christ provided for me and for you. And I believe we find at least, if not more, three key words in these verses that describe different aspects of what he did on Calvary. Notice the first word that we find. We find it there in verse uh, uh, 24. We see the word redemption. Being justified freely by his grace. Notice, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now we sing the song, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And we say, I'm redeemed. What does that mean? What does that word mean? You know that word and its forms are found 120 times in the Bible. Think about that. 
The exact word redemption is 20 times in the Bible, and we find it 11 times in the New Testament. And here's what it means. Listen to it. It'll make your heart glad. Amen? It means this, to purchase someone's release by means of paying a ransom price. I'll say it again. To purchase someone's release by means of paying a ransom price. All of us have heard of somebody has been kidnapped. They take someone and they, they send some sort of note or call and say, you're not getting this person back until you pay a certain amount. And if they don't pay that certain amount, they're not going to get that person back. That's what he's talking about here. This idea of, re of redemption. You see, it has the idea of buying someone back. Watch this. Knocking us down off our high horse. Buying someone back from slavery. You say, that's not me. It is you. And it is me. You know that mankind, as a result of sin, is not only guilty before a holy God and destined for hell, but he's also a slave to sin and a slave to the devil making him entirely helpless and hopeless, a complete slave. But somebody did something for us. They redeemed us. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sin, who, who ransomed us, who, who delivered us. Why? So that we who are slaves, amen, could be set free. Oh, I love that song that we sing. And can it be? I'll be quite honest with you. When we get to that, I think it's the third verse. I like to jump out of my skin. And I'm not a jump out of your skin kind of guy. You ask my wife. I'm kind of reserved, kind of quiet, you know, keep it all inside type of guy. But I'll tell you what. When we sing that, that song where it says, My chains fell off! Man, I want to hit the ceiling. I mean, I get just chills just thinking about that for a moment. Imagine you and I were captive to the devil, captive to sin, destined for hell. It was as if we were walking around with chains around us until we met the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted him as Savior. And at that very moment, hey, our chains fell off. Our heart was free. Praise God. 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Understand the blood of Jesus Christ did something that nothing else can do. It saved us from our sin and redeemed us from the power of sin in our lives. May I say this? No kind of secular humanistic program can do that. No Alcoholics Anonymous or Drugs Anonymous. None of that can do it. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can do that. So we see a first word is a work uh, said to be redemption. But then there's another word we find in verse 25. Notice the second thing he describes this work in verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, that's a $5 word right there. I, I, in the early service, I must have messed that word up 10 times when I was trying to say propitiation. You can go home today after I tell you what it means and, and look smart to your friends and neighbors. Tell them, we learned about propitiation today in church. What did you learn about? Amen. What does it mean? You know that word occurs three times in the New Testament? Right here in Romans 3. And also in 1 John chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 4 as well, uh, as well. It is the same word. Here's the interesting thing. It's the same word that is translated in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 5 as the mercy seat. Now notice it's saying here that God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. What is this mercy seat? Well, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you should know what that is. The mercy seat was a part of the tabernacle and the temple. Think about it for a moment. Now, the tabernacle in the Old Testament was about the size of this room. It wasn't really that big, maybe a little bit bigger. And it had not only the outer court, but it had an inner court. It had a, another, kind of like a box, a rectangle, if you will, 
inside the room with two sections. And the, the center room, the Holy of Holies, was actually square. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, now they did sacrifices throughout, every day they did different things, but once a year something happened called the Day of Atonement. And the high priest would once a year come in to make a, a sacrifice for the sins of everybody, the whole nation of Israel. What he would do, he would walk through, imagine maybe through that back door, and he would walk into the congregation there, and it was of course a little bit different, but the first thing he'd find is the brazen altar. He would uh, sacrifice a lamb. He'd go find a lamb without blemish, a perfect lamb. He'd take that lamb and he'd sacrifice it on the brazen altar. The blood of that lamb would spill down into this catching place at the bottom of the brazen altar. He was commanded to gather up that blood once a year, to walk past the laver, the laver that was there and into that next room called the holy place. Inside the holy place were three items. The golden altar, uh, the candlestick, and the table of shoe bread. He'd actually walk by that with the blood through that room into the next place where there was a veil. He'd walk through the veil and into the place called the holy of holies. A very sacred place that only the high priest could go to once a year. That's it. If he did the wrong thing, he'd die. That's why they would typically have bells down at the bottom, or they'd tie a rope to his ankle in case he died. This way they could drag him out. He'd come in and he'd walk up to that one item that was in the holy place that was about the shape of this communion table, almost identical to this. Little different though, it had staves coming out on each side, which would be like bars. This was for them to carry it out. And here would be the, the top, and on the sides would be two cherubim, golden cherubim, winged, uh, if you will, a cherubim that would be facing one another. Their wings would span out, and they would almost touch at the top. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, after time passed, was only one thing. It used to be Aaron's butted rod and a, a little piece of shoe bread. But the one thing that was left in there were the Ten Commandments. May I remind us, the broken Ten Commandments. The law that mankind has broken sitting in that, uh, that place. What the high priest would do is he'd take that blood and he'd come over and he'd place it on something on top here that was made out of, I believe it was gold if my memory's correct, uh, called the mercy seat. He would sprinkle that blood on top of the mercy seat and when he did that at that very time, the Shekinah glory of God would appear showing that God was satisfied. Because now God could look down upon man who's broken his law if he saw us through the blood. That sounds like something. That sounds like somebody. It sounds like the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, I believe that he took his blood and he ascended back to heaven and he went to the tabernacle that's in heaven and he placed that blood on the eternal mercy seat uh, for you and for me, so that a holy God can now look upon any man that's repented of his sin and trust Jesus Christ as Savior, as absolutely forgiven for his sins because of the blood. Jesus Christ is that propitiatory sacrifice for you and for me. It is the one thing, that act that he did, is the only thing that appeased the wrath of God on mankind. His blood. So he's a propitiation. First John 2, 2 puts it this way. And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He was and is the perfect Lamb of God who willingly bled and died for our sins. He's that sacrifice. But then there's a third thing. There's a third word. We see his work was a work of redemption. It was a work of propitiation. But then we find another word in verse 25 where it says to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. So notice the word remission. So we see his work was a work of redemption. It was a work of propitiation. But he's saying it's also a work of remission. That word's used ten times in the New Testament. Here's what it means. 
It means to dismiss. It means to pass over. It means to disregard. It means to intentionally overlook. Now let me just say something that's very important. God cannot, and I say that because it would go against his very holy, righteous, and just character. He cannot just arbitrarily forgive sin. A lot of people have that idea. You say to them, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? You, they say, oh yes, oh yes, yes I do. Well, how do you know that for sure? Well, you know, God loves me, so, you know, he loves me. He's going to let me in. Yeah, I've done stuff wrong, but doesn't he love me? <laughs> Hold on a minute here. Yes, he loves you, but he cannot violate his righteousness. He can't just say, oh, all right. Go ahead in. Nobody's looking. Go ahead. Go ahead. I've heard someone say, well, I'm going to slip him a $10 bill. He'll let me in. You know? I'll talk to Peter at the Burley Gates. You know? I'll make a deal with him. He'll let me in. doesn't work that way. God is righteous, God is just, God is holy. There must be grounds uh, where he can uh, still be just and also justify us at the same time. And there is. That is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, sin must be paid for. The wages of sin is death. It must be paid for. Somebody's got to pay for your sin. And there's only one of two options. It's either going to be you, and you'll pay for it by going to hell for all eternity, or Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, that's not a tricky one. That's not a tough question. That's not something I have to sit and go, well, let me think about it. Do I want to go and spend eternity in hell, or do I want to let Jesus Christ pay for my sin and go to heaven? Hmm, let me think about that for a moment. No! I'm not going to think about that. You know, the very first time, the very first time that my wife and I heard and understood the gospel. And I'll speak for myself because she'll, I'll let her speak for herself. But very first time I understood the gospel, I got saved because I thought, really? He would do that for me? Well, yeah. No kidding. Yeah, I'll take that. Go to hell or go to heaven and all I do is I let him pay for my, yeah. Yeah. And he can do that. He can be just and the justifier because of the work of Jesus Christ. You see, sometimes we get saved a while. We forget what, what God did for us. Think about it. His work was redemption. He bought us back from an eternity in hell, from a life of who knows what we would have been without the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he was the mercy seat uh, sacrifice. Uh, he was the one that took the wrath of God for me. Uh, he was our remission. He enabled God the Father to justly dismiss my sin. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson, crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. What a wonderful work described for us in these verses. So we see the way disclosed. We see the work described. But then I want you to notice th thirdly, the words dismissed. You see, I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Notice what he asks in verse 27. As after he just got done laying out what Jesus Christ did for us, he says, okay, so where's boasting then? Where is it? In other words, is there anyone, anyone at all, that could stand up and pat themselves on the back and say, yeah, I, I made it to heaven? No. No. Is there anyone that could stand up and say, well, God got a really good deal when he got me? No. He gets the short end of the stick every time. Think about that. Is there anyone that can, that can boast and say, I deserve, I deserve heaven? You know, that's what's so, and I'm going to use this word, wicked, about the doctrine of that... Deny, the doctrine that denies eternal security. That says, yeah, he died for me, but I have to, you know, keep myself saved. Hogwash. Amen. Do you know what you're saying about the blood of Jesus Christ right there? You're saying it wasn't powerful enough to keep you. You're saying it didn't wash away all of your sins. It washed them all away. Amen? Amen. 
And, and if that were the case, you'd get to heaven and say, yeah, I made it. How about you? Man, you'd be high-fiving people. Yeah, yeah, you did it too. Yeah, yeah, you too. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't know where those things come from. <laughs> but the truth is, may I say this kindly as possible? We're all pathetic. To think, to think I could even be standing here today before you. To think we could be teaching a Sunday school class for God. To think we could be on a school, a Sunday school bus, driving it. To think we could be working the sound, singing a special, singing in the choir, ushering for God. I'm just, man, I, like David, I, I'd be a doorkeeper in the house of God, and that would be a privilege. You see, I think sometimes we forget. We begin to have a different attitude towards God and, and His service as if it's begrudging or as if, boy, I just give so much for Him. Boy, I just did too much and nobody else does anything else. And blah, 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 we go, really? 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 Doesn't He deserve it all? Doesn't He deserve every ounce of my energy? Yeah, yeah, you get tired. I get tired too. It's been a week for all of us. But think about it. We're serving the king, the king of kings and lord of lords. What a privilege it is. And by God's grace, we can show up and do what we're supposed to do and do our very best for him. It's a privilege. Boasting is excluded. You see, salvation should not produce a spirit of boasting. It should produce a spirit of humility a spirit of thankfulness, a desire to give him our all, to serve him with all our heart, to tell others about what a great God we have and how he can and will save them if they come to him by faith. That's the attitude we ought to have. Maybe today some of us just need to think about what he did for us. Revisit Calvary and realize that, you know what? I get to serve the king. You see, folks, there is a way to heaven. There is hope for this world. There is. It's Jesus Christ. And we get to serve him. We get to tell others about him. We get to hand out tracts. We get to be in his work. And that's the attitude we ought to have. And we ought to stop looking to the government, the next election, and the next law that's being passed, it's going to get our goat again. And just go ahead and serve our king faithfully until we see him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father.